Hello, everyone. My name is Quentin Ring. On behalf of Beyond Broke Literary Arts Center, I wanted to welcome you to Beyond Within on spiritual practices and narrative forms. With us tonight, we have three brilliant writers and thinkers, Teresa Carmody, Janice Lee, and Thierry Mjodja Mint. I'm excited to introduce them in just a moment, but first I want to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. First, I'd like to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrieliano Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. And as an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting indigenous writers and communities. As many of you know, Beyond Baroque is a literary space in Venice, California. And we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing, presenting contemporary literature and art, and building a diverse literary community. I'm really uh, just very glad to say that after two years of being largely closed, we're reopening for regular events on March 18th. Uh, we should continue to have regular readings every weekend, pretty much uh, you know, through the rest of the season, through June. Um, but before that, we do have a few virtual events uh, that I hope you'll consider attending. On March 5th, uh, this Saturday, we're having an intensive workshop with the poet Douglas Manuel called Cruising Through Forms, There's More Than the Sonnet. Uh, and next Thursday, on March 10th, uh, we're co-presenting a reading and discussion with Urban Word featuring Mahogany Brown and Tonya Ingram. Um, and then on March 12th, we're featuring a program called Beyond Spanish, Spanish which features poetry in Catalan, Basque, Galician, and Spanish. Um, that'll be held in co collaboration with the Spanish consulates. Um, all of those are virtual, so I really hope uh, everyone in the audience can make those as well. Um, you can find information about all those programs in the chats uh, or on our website, beyondbroke.org. Um, I should also mention this has been a difficult, uh, long and difficult two years. Uh, Beyond Broke, we've suffered quite a few challenges as many as many other arts organizations have uh, across the course of the pandemic. So as we get ready to open, we are very much, very much in need of your help. Uh, please do consider making a donation to us as part of this program. Um, it's really just a great assistance to us in the work that we do. Uh, you'll find a link to our donation page in the chat as well. Um, but even more than donating to Beyond Baroque, I would really appreciate it if you consider supporting our readers by buying their books. Uh, we have a book list put together via Bookshop. Um, you can purchase those uh, via that list as well. Um, so let's go ahead and turn to our program. Um, this program is, is occasioned by the re release last fall of Janice Lee's new book, uh, Imagine a Death, um, which is a pretty profound meditation on grief and death amongst other things. Um, but also as with all of Janice's work, it's uh, extremely formally inventive. Um, so for this program, it, was, it came out of a conversation with Janice um, and we wanted to together a group of writers who all share a commitment to working in non-traditional narrative forms, uh, as well as to thinking through the relationship between spirituality, narrative, and poetics. Um, so I'm really just absolutely delighted to have uh, Teresa Carmody and Thierry Mjodja Mint uh, here as well for this conversation and reading. Um, I think it's just gonna be really, really very illuminating. Um, so we're gonna start by having each of the authors read. And then Janice will have a few questions to start a discussion with the authors. Uh, we will have space for a Q&A at the end of the program. If you'd like to pose some questions via the chat, um, I'll go ahead. I, I think I'll just go ahead and introduce each author now and we'll take it from there. Um, Teresa Carmody's writing includes fiction, creative, nonfiction, inner arts collaborations and hybrid forms. She's the author of Maison Femme, a fiction and the reconception of Marie which is long listed for the Big Others Reader's Choice Award uh, in fiction. Um, shorter work has appeared in Lit Hub, Los Angeles Review of Books, Matters of Feminist Practice, and Bur Nibiru Review. Uh, she is co-founding editor of uh, Le Figue Press and director of Stetson University's MFA of the Americas. Uh, Thierry Mjodja Mint is the author of a novel, The End of Peril, The End of Enmity, The End of Strife, A Haven which won an Asian Pacific American Award for Literature and a book of creative nonfiction, uh, Names for Light, A Family History, which is the winner of the 2018 Gray Wolf Press Nonfiction Prize. She's an assistant professor of English at Amherst College. Janice Lee is a Korean American writer, editor, teacher, and shamanic healer. She's the author of seven books of fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry. Most recently, The Sky Isn't Blue, uh, as well as Imagine a Death and Separation Anxiety. She lives in Portland, Oregon, where she is an assistant professor of creating, creative writing at Portland State University. 
Um, Janice is going to kick things off. So really, I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone for being here, um, to all of our authors and our audience, as well as uh, Angeline Keck, who's behind the scenes running Zoom. So Janice, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Quentin, um, and Beyond Baroque, and uh, Jimmy, and Angeline. Um, it really means so a lot beyond broke is really important space um, for me when I was living in Los Angeles. So it's great to be here virtually. Um, and it also just means a lot for me to be in conversation with both Teresa and Theory, who are two of my favorite human beings and writers. And I have learned so much about writing and spirituality from, from both of them. So um, it really means a lot to, to be in this conversation today. Um, so I'm just going to read um, a few really short excerpts from Imagine a Death. Um, the, the book is organized into these vignettes um, and um, some of the vignettes are a little bit longer like chapters and some of them are shorter and I'm just gonna read a few of the shorter ones. Um, so this first one is called The Dream. In a dream, there is a small huddled crowd of people, their faces bright from the encroaching lava that is slowly crawling towards them from all sides. They are surrounded and it is obvious to all of the individuals that there is no escape from the fiery deaths. So they do not ask how it is that they got here, and they do not ask what they might do now to save themselves. Rather, in these final moments together, they crowd closer together, not to give themselves an extra breath or two, though naturally that also, but to actually get closer together. That in these moments before death, they want to leave in the intimacy of each other whether strangers or friends or family. They want to feel what it is to be loved and to be in the entanglements of intimacy with other bodies, the warmth of limbs, the prayers received from others, the tears of terror that transform into tears of generosity and gratitude. And they all grasp at each other, trying to feel each other's bodies, each other's hands, just each other. And as the lava creeps further and further, they can feel the heat from the steam, the skin on their faces starts to boil, those on the outer perimeter start to scream as their outer layers burn away and their feet simply disintegrate into the mass of lava. The intense heat, heat here, probably an inadequate word to describe the actual temperature of the fiery mass about to consume them in totality. For just a blink of existence, reminding them of what it means to feel anything in life and to feel anything in death, both the joy and all of the pain, all of those human feelings as a giant and intense mass before they are obliterated and relieved of their burdens forever. This one is the dog and it's from the point of view of the dog. I wake up and look for the trees. It is warm and bright, but I feel the sadness of the wilted leaves on the ground, roots unrooted, and I try to find my bearing, but I only feel the harshness of the sun. My scent trails have dissipated, but the sadness bears heavier than any smell. I don't see the woods at the mountain's edge. Instead, the dreariness of the swamps, wet and damp and encompassing, the dreariness takes over the landscape. All of the pointed, elegant trees are missing from this vantage point, and again, I feel the heaviness, the sadness of it all. Who is crying? It seems to be coming from everywhere, yet the light remains, and yet some of us are still here. I'm gonna read another dog, also the dog, it's a theme here, <laughs> the dog. There is the veering in my nostrils. It's a season of death and resurrection, but what season isn't? She veers is veering, but if she misses anybody, it is the ghost that becomes an intimate confidence. I wish she could understand how gracefully we can slide into the images of dirt here, that the mountains speak, but she cannot hear them. We are all veering constantly, and to be alone doesn't mean to be dejected, but still with each other. She lives by mirages, 
but realizing that the mirages and the everything else are becoming each other constantly and that her reflection is constantly becoming her just as she is constantly becoming her reflection. There are certain things I have become accustomed to. I don't know why I bite. I don't miss anybody because I don't know how, but I know what I am attached to, and that is everything. Whoever said it was easy to understand their real self? A dog, probably, but at least this is a wonderful place to be unhappy in. And then... I'm going to read um, one more vignette, also called The Dream. It's only dogs and dreams today. And so this is also The Dream. In a dream, there is a girl who encounters a large bear in the woods. And the bear, in its insistence at being a bear, stands tall and growls menacingly to warn the girl to turn back and go home. And the girl, in its insistence at being a girl, who still falls asleep gripping her teddy bear tightly, moves closer, wondering how soft the bear's fur might be. And the bear, though confused but gripped with his own intentions and narrative, bears his teeth and the girl runs forward, squealing and giggling and wraps her arms around one of the bear's legs and feels the rough fur on her cheek and a strange but not unfamiliar odor emanating from his body. And the bear slowly leans down and strikes the girl, who is still hugging him tightly with his claws and discards the little body into the river where it stains the surrounding water red and redder and what the girl had thought to herself just before she was killed was how much coarser the fur had felt than she had expected but still the warmth was comforting and that she could have fallen asleep right then and there and i will end there thank you i think Teresa is going to read next That was amazing. Thanks, Janice. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Beyond Baroque. Um, it's actually um, where I gave my MFA thesis reading so many years ago. And actually, now that I think about it, it was like a very early version of this book. Um, so that's many, many, many years ago. Um, so I'm going to, um, and it's just, it's, it's so delightful also to be here in conversation with theory um, too. So. Um, I'm going to read from The Reconception of Marie, um, and which looks like this. Um, and I, um, there's, for those who don't, don't know, there's many different um, sort of points of view that run through this book, um, including Marie as a 13 year old, when she's a 17 year old, when she's an eight year old, um, and then also as an adult, sort of looking back and um, reflecting on her own um, spiritual um, evolution or you know deconstruction from evangelical Christianity, but also she is looking at different um, paintings um, by Fra Angelico, specifically in the convent of San Marco. And um, I was going to read like all day and uh, all week. I thought I was going to read this section that. Um, really grapples with sort of authoritarian energy. Um, but um, kind of at the last minute, I was like, I'm going to pull cards for tonight, and then something else emerged. So I'm going to read instead uh, what the card said, and I will be referencing a, um, a, a image. And so if you want to see the image while I'm reading it, um, you can use the link there. But, um, and it's sort of interesting thinking especially about the first piece that Janice read. Um, so this is, um, I'm just going to, I don't, I'm just going to jump in. Um, a few nights before she left for Florence, she had sex with her friend Tanya. They'd met months earlier in a summer language class and had immediately begun flirting. She recognizes this now, Though at the time she couldn't see it, how she only wanted to be with Tanya, who was so funny and charming, only a few years older, yet seemingly so much wiser, who had been out as a lesbian since freshman year of college, 
Her parents wished she were straight, Tanya explained, but there's a certain acceptance of eccentricity in the South. Tanya was white from North Carolina. She had a flair for storytelling and turning the ordinary into something worth talking about. Several times over the days before her departure, the air between them became thick with tension. She kept touching Tanya's shoulder or arm, half hoping, though not realizing even this, that Tanya would cross that other boundary, would lean in, would kiss her. When she finally did, they were both a little drunk. The next morning, Tanya apologized, which confused her. You don't have to apologize, she said, but nothing more. For she understood Tanya's apology as her escape, as if sex had been Tanya's seduction instead of something they did together. On the flight to Florence, she kept replaying everything. Tanya was the second woman she'd slept with, which meant she could no longer dismiss the first woman as an accident. She felt knotted and anxious, like the world was falling apart. She decided that while being gay was okay for others, she didn't think Tanya or her other friends were evil or going to hell, she really didn't. But she needed to choose heterosexuality for herself because she didn't know if she could do it if she could be with a woman and still feel spiritually safe. She was beginning to understand the power of interpretation, how perspective creates the social imaginary, makes the frame, determines the picture. To view the Bible as history, for example, turns the stories literal, which lessens in some ways their metaphorical weight. Alternatively, to view the Bible as a hybrid of poetry, literature, chronicles, and epistles collectively written and collaboratively assembled is to see the Bible as a stranger, perhaps more dangerous book, alive and mutable, crossing and decreating categories. That's how she felt too. She was trying to write a life story that didn't move from one clear frame into another. San Marco, cell three. The room itself is a round arch filled with other arches. The painting is another annunciation. Gabrielle's wings remained rainbowed, and Mary kneels and looks down, holding an open book in the crook of her left arm. Behind the angel, St. Peter of Verona stands, palms pressed together in the same prayer gesture she was required to hold under the nun's watchful gaze during weekday mass at Sacred Heart. In the painting, St. Peter of Verona fixes his eyes on Mary as blood drips from a wound on his head, the same spot where, in other depictions of the saint, a cather's sword is left lodged in his skull. But this painting shows a moment of grace, the witnessing of divine articulation. There is light emanating softly from the angel while a door is visible behind Mary, whose shadow marks the wall. Gabrielle's shadow is fainter, barely there, while St. Peter of Verona is shadowless, his body crossed instead by the obscure tips of Gabrielle's wings. The three figures stand in a room ceilinged with arched lines which correspond to the arch of the picture's painted frame, which is itself rendered to mirror the architecture of the cell. To the painting's right is a prayer nook, a segmental arch with a window inside. The window shutter, another kind of arch, opens so that when sunlight shines through, another temporary arch is made on the cell's mahogany floor. Frame inside frame inside another way of seeing, plaster, paint, wood, sound, light. In Florence, she stood before Savonarola's cell, staring at the ecstatic saint painted in a circle above its entrance. This must be Mary Madalena de Pazzi, she thought, though it could be St. Teresa, St. Cecilia, St. Catherine, this woman who levitates, back arched, arms open, gazing into the unseen by the viewer beyond. She's surrounded by cherubs, and there's a male figure, too, who tries but does not touch her, who looks away as if he cannot bear her sight, for her experience is as sensorial as it is metaphysical, a serious act of liberation manifest in multiple realms, her body a hinge, a spine, a book opened to divine inscription, to being re-known, re-read, re-connected, to being re-cognized as light and love, the source from which she comes and comes and yes, 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 there my love, that's right. She tried to be straight, but couldn't, because she wasn't. 
to be otherwise would be to choose the lessening light. I'll stop there. Thanks. That was incredible, Teresa and Janice. Um, I just want to start by saying that it is, it's unreal to be um, reading with you both, Teresa and Janice, um, you know, two writers I've admired for such a long time. Um, it really is such an honor. I want to thank um, every, the folks at Beyond Baroque. Um, I also want to thank the participants who have been so active and lively in the chat. Um, even though I can't see, we can't see your faces, it's really wonderful to um, see your words and your names in the participants list. Um, so I'm Theory and I'm joining from Amherst, Massachusetts, um, Nonatuck land um, in Western Mass. Um, although everything seems to be Western Mass, that's not Boston. Um, it's really more like Central Mass by the Connecticut River. Um, and I'm gonna be reading from Names for Light. Uh, and the book, I suppose I should explain a little bit about the structure of the book as well. So it's divided into um, different chapters uh, with that are based on places. Um, so each chapter has a place name and um, there's multiple narratives in the book, uh, some that are about my um, experiences living different places, some that are about my parents, my maternal ancestors, and my paternal ancestors. Um, and part, part of the reason I wanted to foreground place names is because my family has moved a lot, um, not just um, between countries, but within countries. And I wanted to foreground that movement of uh, moving within a country, because I feel like in America, the movement to America becomes the sort of defining um, identity making movement, right? One gets a label as an immigrant, for example, for making that move, but other moves are, are somehow not identity forming. Um, and so I wanted to read a section that I haven't read before. I always like to do that. Um, and it's called Mimbu. And it's, that's the name of the town um, where my grandmother, my paternal grandmother was born. So I'll just dive right in. My grandmother's childhood came to an end with the war. The night before her city, Mimbu, was bombed, the larger city across the river, Magui, was bombed first. The people in Mimbu had never seen explosions before and mistook them for fireworks. The city did not have many electric lights yet, and it was beautiful to see the night sky lit up. The river was very wide, the air wadi, the lifeblood of the country, and the two cities were far apart enough, with an island between them, that the explosions were muted, and the sounds of people crying out in fear and pain did not carry across the water. In Mimbu, people gathered at the riverbank and clapped. Years later, after the war, my grandfather would sail up the same river, the Arawadi, which connected Iya and Mimbu, and countless other villages and towns and cities to court my grandmother. River is a noun derived from a verb, that which rives, which splits, rents, or severs, which tears asunder. River, splitter, renter, severer, error, or terror. To be a river is to carve up the earth, to tear it apart silently with water which has no hands. Even the sound of the word pricks the tongue, the V in the middle, which splits the word itself into two, re and er, beginning and ending with an R, almost a palindrome. I repeat the word again and again, tasting the sharp point of the V, the suffix that follows parting my lips, the Mara word for river is mit, or the English word for, river, for mit is river. Mit, the word I learned first, meaning root or river, rhyming with bit, the word for thick, and only one letter off from my name in both the Mar and English. Mit meaning deep and mit meaning high. 
The more speakers must have known that opposites are not vastly different, but often almost the same, like a shadow or a reflection. The morning after Maguey was bombed, planes dropped flyers over Minbu. They were going to be bombed that night. The story my father told was not of my grandmother who made it safely to the beach, which was the designated evacuation site, but of her relative, an uncle who had forgotten something back at his house. He told his wife he would catch up with her at the beach, but he never showed. When the bombings ended and they returned to the city the next day, they found the uncle's body blown apart at the threshold of his house. My grandmother's mother died during the war when the family was hiding in the countryside. I asked my father what she died of and he said she was a very fragile sort of person. It was said she died because she could not endure the fright and shock of the war. But it's hard to say, my father said, in those days, they couldn't take her to see a good doctor. My other grandmother, my mother's mother, also had a parent who died during the war when she was about the same age. For a long time, I thought it was a strange coincidence that both my grandmothers would have suffered the same fate. Both great-grandparents were in their early 40s when they passed away, and both grandmothers were teenagers. It was only later that I realized it was not a coincidence at all but simply a common fate for many families. The British invaded through the rivers, through the Miet, which they renamed River. The roots of the country became that which tore the country apart, that which split rent and severed the land. The British sailed up the Arabody with their Trojan horse of the fleet, with their decoy prince, and the people lined up along the banks to watch it pass. In Bamar, the words for invasion, conquest, and occupation are everyday words, the same words I use as a child while playing. To invade is to butt in, to conquer is to boss, and to occupy is to hog. I do not know if the Bamar words were meant to soften the shame of being colonized or falling for a mean trick, or if it is the English words are euphemisms that allow English-speaking children to grow up and colonize others without shame. If the English word for river had not been river, but had been something else, nyit, root, for example, or death, I think the British would have sailed up the air with the all the same. Roots too can be parasitic. There are plants that extract nutrients and water, not from the earth, but from the bodies of other plants. There is a name for roots that do this, Astoria. There is a name for every kind of violence. I never asked my grandmother how the war affected her, except once when she was already losing her memory. We were seated at the dining table at my aunt's house, my father, me, my two aunts who lived as my grandmother. My grandmother acted if she had not heard my question. Maybe she did not. Maybe she did not want to answer. At the end of her life, my grandmother no longer recognized me. The last time she spoke to me, she said, who is this child? I did not know how to answer her. It's me, I kept saying, don't you remember? It's me. But my grandmother did not remember. She could not even remember her own children. She had seven children who lived, three boys and four girls. I remember hearing once as a child that she had had as many as a dozen pregnancies. She had spent over two decades bearing and birthing children. I wonder at what point a woman begins to lose herself to her children, at what point her body is created from them, by them, rather than the other way around. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Oh my God, both those readings were so beautiful. Um, I'm just thinking about a lot of things and there was a question I wanted to ask you both and um, kind of versions of this came up in both of your readings. Like something that I've been thinking a lot about is just categories and separation. Um, and I think Teresa, like you said something like decreating categories um, and, and theory that like opposites that are actually almost the same. Um, 
And, and I, and I wonder about like both your relationships to categories. And I'm thinking like specifically about categories such as writing versus spiritual practice or creative practice versus intellectual practice, um, those kinds of categories. Um, and especially for me, like it's taken a really long time to get to a place where I feel like I have something that I would call a spiritual practice, but it's also become much more of a blending. Like when I was younger, I think I categorized things much more um, like my, my publishing practice, like my work as, a, as being an editor was very different from being a writer. It was very different from like my day job was very different than like, you know, um, and now like I start to see more as I develop more of a practice, I actually start to see less seams in between all of those things. Um, but it's taken me so long to, to get here. And I'm just curious to hear, yeah, about your relationships to, to, to categories of practice. Uh, Teresa. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can, I can talk, I can go, I can talk first. If, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, categories, like I, I feel similarly, Janice, like it's taken a long time to, um, to let things, to see things more fully, which to me mm -hmm. means like you start to see where there's actually all of these um, spaces where the rooms bleed into each other, right? Um, I mean, I um, I think even about like, you know, like like the smallest units of our bodies, like the smallest, like, like mm -hmm. I can't even think of the physics words right now, but like how even like the electrons are not stable, they're like constantly changing. And so there, and there is no, an, origin point there is no true mm. you know that that it's like they're constantly shifting so but I feel like yes so um I I think in terms of spiritual practice so so I I came to writing through nonfiction. I'll start here a second um because I thought that I didn't have an imagination and that I couldn't make things up so, um, and then over time, it's like, I started to understand that I didn't see much of a difference between life and writing. Mm -hmm. So, and it was like, I became, I was obsessed with writing things that, that were experiences that I was also living or experiences that I was mm -hmm. uh, encountering in life. But then the more like that line then th then goes into like spiritual practice, which is, like a kind of mindfulness in a sort of presence, right? And the way that you can actually hold a kind of altar and temple inside you, it starts to be like, oh, everything actually is first spirit, right? Like first, like that is the, that is the um, originating source from which all of this stuff, all of this like living, all of this connecting, all of this writing, like to me, like, uh, that's where it all comes from, this source that's in me that's also elsewhere. Now that's when I'm like feeling calm. <laughs> like, doesn't mean that I'm always like, oh, look here, I'm divine source. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that the, you know, categories can help us feel safe and they can also be really helpful and they can be fun to play with and press against just like rooms can be interesting places to like, um, to like, you know, decorate and sort of like shift around. I think the problem is, is like when you get stuck in a corner and you think that's all it is mm -hmm. in, in terms of a category or a space. Mm -hmm. Theory? <laughs> yeah, thank you for saving me, Teresa, and going first, because I feel like just listening to you speak has generated ideas for me. And this is a wonderful question, Janice. So, so thought provoking. Um, Firstly, I just want to apologize if I'm a little bit low energy because it is an hour and a half past my bedtime, despite it only being 9.30 Eastern time. Um, I've basically just started sleeping when my baby sleeps and waking up <laughs> when he wakes up. And so eight to five is sort of my new schedule. So I apologize. I mean, I'm obviously with many wakings during the night. Um, but so I apologize if I'm kind of low energy, but I am very present. Um, 
I think that for me, I wanted to answer this question, Janice, by saying like, oh, I don't have boundaries. Like it's hard for me to um, even really um, find the themes between my different selves. But then as I was listening to Teresa talk, I realized that was a lie. <laughs> because actually, I think that when I was a child, there was very much a uh, very much a strict boundary between private life and public life, partly because for the first seven or eight years of my life, um, seven years of my life, I grew up in um, Thailand where I was not Thai, my family wasn't Thai, and we didn't speak Thai. And so there was this boundary between the home life where we were Burmese and then living in this foreign country. Um, that was a foreign country despite being the only country I knew I had memories of. And so I think there was this big divide between public and private, right? And then when we moved to the United States, that divide remained because there was always the sense of, for example, my spiritual life being something that I assumed the average American would not have, would not know, uh, would not understand or would not have fluency with, right? And so there was always the sense that I had to keep certain parts of my life separate from each other. Like I had to be a certain person at school, speak a certain language and then be a different person at home. Um, and I think that it's, it's only recently that um, the different people <laughs> blended together. Uh, and it's only recently that I started feeling more comfortable doing, doing that blending even in my professional life, for example. Um, I think this is my third year teaching at Amherst College. And I think when I first arrived, even in terms of how I dressed, I would be very careful about being professional. And in terms of the way I expressed myself to my students and the sort of ideas I would express to them, I would try to be very professional. Um, but now I think I find myself not really having the energy to uphold these boundaries anymore, um, just because I'm, I just don't have the time, I think, to really uh, uphold these boundaries or the energy to uphold them. And I just find myself basically um, sharing, yeah, how I really feel and think with my students sometimes um, without, without censoring myself. And maybe uh, there's a lot of privilege in being able to do that. Maybe there's a lot of um, folly that I'm, I'm not really, maybe I'm not prepared for the backlash that that's gonna bring, right, later on. Um, but it's been honestly like the only way that I can kind of continue right now because I'm so exhausted um, just from having a baby and starting this new job. It's, yeah, I just feel like I, I find myself not being able to keep up these boundaries that, um, I had internalized as a child. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love, I love both of what you, um, what you both said so much, and it, it just makes me think so much about, like, for me, when I'm, when I'm upholding boundaries, what I usually realize that it's out of a place of fear, um, like, oh, I have to do this, otherwise, like, this will happen. Um, and sometimes, like, I don't have the energy, like, you, theory, just like, well, I'm just not gonna care. And then other times, I'm like, no, the fear is like real, and at least in this current moment, I'm just gonna have to act on it. Um, and I think about like one of the first ways that I came to what I would call a more spiritual practice is like learning to read signs or synchronicities like in the world. I'm just going to use the word synchronicities, like whether it was like birds, you know, talking to me or seeing things. Um, and I don't want to call them coincidences because I think when we call things like a coincidence, it's like a preemptive dismissal of any significance, right? Um but I think for a long time, and I think this is like a common way of, of, of dismissing anything that might be like spiritual is like, there's the myth that we're actually giving up our power over to some divine being. And it took what, what, what I realized for me was like, oh, when I'm seeing these things as significant, it's not about giving up my agency to some other power. It's actually about my own agency in recognizing the wisdom that I already have, that's already inside in my relationship to the world. Um, and it's just taking that thing to show me that, right? It's like a, it's like a roundabout way. Um, 
So I'm, so I'm thinking about like form. So this is actually like leading to my question about, about form. Um, and, and because I've had conversations with both of you like about narrative forms and structures and experimental forms and innovative forms. And like increasingly I've become like really uncomfortable with words like experimental because I really don't know what they mean anymore. Like I think they were really useful for me for a long time and they're becoming less and less useful and more and more like enraging, frankly. Um, and so I just, I wanna ask you both like, cause we all, like all of our books are dealing with forms in different ways. And I know um, outside these books and you know other, other works that we've done, um, just how, how you're both thinking about form, I think both like as a container, but also maybe the other way, like, like as a way of articulating a lens of the world, right? Because I don't think, I think oftentimes like in literary spaces, we talk about forms as being these containers that we've created to hold things or like we're going to put things into containers. Um, but I don't think it's always that, like it, it, maybe it's both, like maybe it's many things. Um, anyways, I'll start, I'll stop rambling. <laughs> Theory, do you want to go first this time? Yeah. I do. Um, I want to start, Janice, by telling you that after you visited my class and talked about how you don't think of your writing as experimental writing, but you think of um, the sort of divergences you're making from traditional forms as finding a container for your stories. So many students have, I have eavesdropped them, like quoting that to each other on campus. <laughs> um, so you're, yeah, but anyway, I think and that has really impacted my thinking too, um, hearing you say that, because it made me realize that um, the form that my writing takes, which I had just sort of written off as intuitive and not really worth trying to explain in a logical way, I think it made me realize that actually um, there, it's based on sort of my worldview or it's coming out of my worldview and understanding. Um, because I think fragmentation in writing. So in my, in my book, for example, there's a lot of white space and there's a lot of fragments. Um, I think fragmentation in writing in a Western context is often thought of as a break with, um, it's often thought of in, in the modernist sense of like, okay, after World War I, we had a break from enlightenment and we, you know, we realize that um, holistic, all-encompassing narratives are not possible. I think that's often how um, fragmentation is sort of thought of. But I realized that for me, that's not that's not the tradition I'm writing in. And for me, fragmentation is more about like the Buddhist animist worldview that um, we are all part of each other, but separated from each other, right? Um, that it's hard to explain rebirth um, to people who may not be familiar with, with um, the specifically like Buddhist idea of it or the Theravada Buddhist idea of it, but it's not rebirth in the sense that there's one life that gets continued on and different, and there's one soul that gets reborn into different bodies and different lives. It's more in the sense that um, all beings, which includes not just humans, but non-human living entities uh, have been interconnected for not, I mean, time is a measurable time and that um, every person or every being that we meet has been um, dearest to us, most beloved and also most hated. Um, and like that sort of having that sort of grand cosmology is what leads to this idea of trying to escape it through uh, nirvana. But before the escape, everything is interconnected, everything is fragmented. And for me, like that's where the fragmentation is coming from. Um, it's not from a breakage, it's, it's literally the source of, of life. Um, so that's one way in which I feel like, yeah, like I realized that the forms that I'm using um, have a completely different meaning to me, I, I think, than maybe to other writers, mm -hmm. even if there are like similarities on the surface. I love that theory. <laughs> um, and that, uh, yeah. Um, 
So when you were talking to, I, I was thinking about, um, well, increasingly, so I think of, um, I think all writing is experimental because I think that it's an, always an experiment. So I think of it, I, so, you know, sort of hearkening back to theories reading where river is like the, not like words are becoming a noun and a verb. It's like, it's an experiment. I think of it as, as, a, as a thing in practice, right? Um, and that often with form that it's about listening. Like for me, it's about listening. So listening to the, what the work is asking to be, to articulate, which was something that was really hard. Like that, you know, like um, that's something that as when I was learning as a younger writer, it was hard to, um, to sort of get into this reciprocity with language. Um, because I would thought I would knew, you know, I, I don't know, it just, it, to under, to start to hear something that's like different than what I was, different than what I thought it was going to be. So that, so listening to, to what is happening on the page, um, but also then listening to something that's happening um, on a, in a deeper aspect of myself or in another aspect of myself. So, um, so I'll speak like formally, like with this particular novel, for example, um, the form, um, like the, 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 there was an intuitive aspect, but the actual form of it came in part because it was this energy of trying to integrate these different, um, isolated parts of self. And like, how do you actually have that as a narrative structure? Like if it's not a, like the, the sort of narrative, um, journey or process isn't about coming into, you know, like the traditional sort of Bildens Roman, it's like going on the hero's quest and then being, um, you know, uh, finding your way in society and being welcomed back into society. Well, the, my narrator is leaving this like white Christian nationalist world. I don't want her to be integrated back into that world. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> like what? So instead, it was much more about listening to what it was like the different parts of herself and letting those different parts of herself actually speak on the page. And then also like asking myself on a like really deep level, like, what do I want to say? Like, I feel like there's, um, I feel like there's something I think that that there is a question, there is something about form in that, like, what do you actually want to say? But also that um, sometimes for many years, it would, it was like the idea that you were trying to say something in your writing. I, I felt like this, like, that was like, a, like only bad writers did that. Like you were supposed to not be trying to say anything. You're just supposed to be like an artist. <laughs> um, but I think actually, you know, um, that, 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 that there's something that, the the something inside that yearns to express and it might not always come out in a way that's legible to other people or it might not come out in a way that's um yeah it or or it might be it might be like listen you know my soul cards the hierophant or the pope and i have some teachings for you mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. I'm, I'm taking so many notes. I'm just like, oh, let me, <laughs> let me write all this down to talk to my but, students about next week. Um, but, Jen, yeah. I'm curious about hearing the form for Imagine a Death. Like, how did you, like, how are you thinking about this question? Yeah. Um, and, and I'll also say, like, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can, this is a good time to put a question in the chat. Um, but yeah, the, the form, like, it, it mostly came to me and that's not how I normally work. Like normally, um, or at least previous to this, I was much more of like, I'm going to be in control and I'm going to have this form and the form is going to mean these things. And um, this book, like, I mean, I, I was working on the first chapter for like a super long time. I just rewrote the first chapter like over and over again for weeks. Um, but like, it, it kind of felt like the book started to become channeled where like, okay, I, I wrote that and that was the character. And then I was like, well, now I want to have another character. And then I just wrote that in a single sitting 
And I wrote the next part another in a single sitting. And it just started turning into this thing where each time I sat down to write, it was like, this is, I want you to hear from this person or this voice, like this next. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't written in the order it's in, but much of it was pretty close to that. Like it just was this intuitive sense that um, there were different things and different threads that wanted to be part of it. Um, and so I didn't plan it. It was like, it wasn't until I was like more than half a draft but it was like oh I guess this is the form <laughs> like I guess now I'll, I'll continue um but yeah I didn't decide on it and that's really different from for me <laughs> yeah um oh we have a question in the chat um on the listening sense isn't it the journey of the writer as the novel story unwinds over time I'm trying to understand it as a question. I think, um, well, and Oksana, um, thank you for that question. I like, I'm sort of understanding it to be like the way that, um, like how sometimes when you're listening to the story too, mm. like, and so you, you're um, listening to something and seeing how, like you don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but then your characters might start doing something that is surprising to you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and um, which I think, I don't, I don't know if that's what is meant by that question. <laughs> that's sort of like, that's how I'm sort of understanding it. I think that that's a little bit, sometimes that can be, or my experience is that can be a little bit different if you're working in, um, in nonfiction, um, like the listening, it's not that you're not listening, like you don't necessarily know where things are going to go, but it can feel a little bit, um, it can feel different because often, or at least for me, because often there's stories that, or there's a, there's material that I think I know. And actually what's happening through the writing is learning how to see it differently it's like which is what where which is where it becomes also to me a spiritual practice right because it's so much of spiritual practice is about actually like shifting your position so that you can see the many different angles of something um so yeah i mean i can i can add like like with this novel in particular like it was one of the hardest things I've ever written and I'm like I never want to write another novel I mean it's not true but it's kind of how I feel where like because I was changing so much it was so hard like every time I was like well how am I supposed to go back and be consistent with these like other 50 pages that I have like that it felt impossible and so I had this urge to like write a whole new novel every time I sat down um but there were also moments where um, like there's there's a few moments of pretty intense and grotesque violence in this book and I really grappled with those moments um, and especially moments of violence towards animals um, and I didn't choose to have them in the book like the the book was really asking for those moments and I would I, I resisted so much writing them um, because I really didn't want to have these violent moments just for the sake of having violence or to have these moments of violence also define the characters because that's also not what they're doing. Um, but they were really necessary in this entire landscape of how everything was connected. Um, but I really resisted that and the book was like, no, um, like this is part of it. And I was just like, well, um, but yeah, I still have a hard time with those moments actually. I just want to add also to um, Oksana, your question and sort of your, what you shared is, I think in my experience of writing, I also feel that um, I take turns with the writing on who is leading. So sometimes I am the one, me, the author, mm -hmm. and, and the one pushing the text along, leading the text somewhere. Other times I feel like it's the text that's leading me somewhere, right? Um, and I think that sometimes it feels like when I was starting out, it felt like to me that if I was a good enough writer, the text would always lead me somewhere. And that would make me a real writer if I was always following the text. 
And I think that that's too high of an expectation to set and an unrealistic expectation. And I realized that it's okay if there are times when I'm the one leading because I've changed, I've evolved. And it, it reminds me of also like a discovery I've made with my spiritual practice too, where I used to think that it was faith that led to ritual or like faith that led to spiritual practice. And as I got older, I realized it's actually the opposite as well. That sometimes even when I don't have faith, um, just doing a ritual, just doing a practice is what sort of inspires and generates that faith. And I think it's the same thing for writing. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Um, so maybe we have time for one more question because um, I want to be conscious of time. Um, yeah, maybe like Teresa or Theory, if you have a question even. I do, I do have a question um, <laughs> that that is for both of you. <laughs> and it's partly because, so I was teaching a class today and one of my students was talking to me about being inspired by Janice's book, Imagine a Death, to write about, um, to write about non-human voices. Um, and the question that he had for Janice apparently was like, how do you do that? And apparently you had said, listen to the plants and animals in your life. <laughs> um, and, and I'm kind of asking on his behalf, but also on my behalf, which is like, how do we do that, right? How do we actually do that? And I know that Teresa, earlier this evening, you were also talking about the importance of listening, um, listening to what the text wants and what you want also. But I mean, I guess I'm just asking for myself, you know, because I feel like I, I love those ideas. I think they're beautiful ideas, but I just want some like concrete um, practices maybe, or even rituals uh, that, that can ground us in what that listening might look like. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't remember saying that, but, but, but I, maybe I did. Um, I, I mean, Sorry I think I'm misquoting you. No, no, I mean, I probably did say it. I have a terrible memory, but like sometimes I just say things. Um, <laughs> but I think, um, like, I'm I'm thinking a lot about what Teresa said about listening, and 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 I'm just thinking about all of the different ways in which listening can manifest, and especially lately for me, listening has been a lot of accepting that I might not hear anything. Like that's been my recent listening practice. Is that. I might ask things and then I might not get responses or things that feel concrete, like just to sit in that silence or um, uncertainty, which is also listening, um, which turns into also like a trust and like an acceptance of, an, of uncertainty, but also a trust of myself. Um, so even if I am listening to like plants or animals, um, it's not that I'm always having a conversation with them. Like sometimes that might occur, um, but sometimes it might not occur in the way that I want it to. And so in order for me to be open to what that listening really is going to be, which is not going to be on my own terms, I have to accept that, like, I might not, it might not seem like I'm receiving anything, but to just trust that I am being changed by that encounter, by just the gesture of listening. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I think for, for me, um, I mean, I love that the, that listening isn't about hearing what you want to hear, you know, that you might not, there might not be anything that you hear. I, I, I know for me, um, like really starting to have like a, a daily, um, meditation practice was a turning point because I could start to slowly um, distinguish between the different voices I was hearing and like sometimes voices that were just coming in that weren't me, you know? Um, but you start to, and, and just starting to have more um, awareness in general. I think with, um, I think like with different, like, I feel like, um, 
you know, I, I think about always Amanda Ackerman, um, who I worked with, like we published one of her books with um, Leafy called The Book of Feral Flora. And I learned so much about listening from her and I'm like so grateful for that, but also that she was doing all of these different kinds of projects with plants and writing with the plants in different ways. And, um, and even working with this like sound designer who um, like hooked it up so that she could read to the plants and then the plants would like take this audio in. And, and actually this is like a technology that like the CIA and stuff has used too for spying, like legit. I've heard this on NPR, so you know it has to be true. But anyway, so, but, and then some, some of the plants would, um, would like take the, these sound vibrations in and then they would repeat them and they would make their own new poems. But Amanda said, I re always remember Amanda saying like some plants don't want to work with you. Like some plants, they don't want to work with you. And some plants don't want to work in English. Like they might be fine working like with a language, but they don't like English, <laughs> you know? And I think about that, I think about like also the proximity that you have with different plants and animals, you know, that it's like any kind of relationship. How are you attending, like tuning in to who that other, who the other is um, and just being with them energetically. And that often I think it's like being with energetically is a way to kind of and like giving attention is a way to note it is a noticing and that a noticing is a kind of listening. So I think about like the plants in my house, it's like, you know, the times when I haven't been listening to them as opposed to when I have been listening to them or the times when I know that my dog is seeing something, like I can hear it so clearly. Or, I mean, last week I had this, and uh, you know, I was dreaming that Mary was going to the bathroom and then I woke up and she got up and I, and she, which meant she had to go to the bathroom. And so I took her outside and she went to the bathroom. I mean, I, so I think that these kinds of like you can tune in, um, but it's like, how are you being present? I guess. So I think like a, a, a to get back to your question about like something tangible theory, I think like rituals or like a practice in actually being present, like in the now is a way of actually tuning the, tuning the, um, the, the hearing like the internal, like your internal hearing, your internal listening for yourself and others. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I wish I could just talk to you both like all night, but, um, but it's, it's time for bed. I think for some people, <laughs> um, thank you both so, so much for this. Um, and thank you everyone, um, who's here, um, Quentin, do you want to say anything to close or? Yeah, I would just echo you, Janice, and say I could listen to this all night, but I wish, you know, maybe we should have a round two sometime, but, um, you know, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Thierry. Um, just an absolute pleasure to have you read and, and, and listen to you talk as well. And so, um, again, thanks to Angeline too for running the, the Zoom. And um, I think that's, about it as far as I'm concerned so thank you so much good night everyone thank you so much everyone good night thank you everyone good night everyone